There you go. So I'm not with strong keyboard, that's why, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the same as me. Right. What do we say we'd do this evening? Well, there's three things, actually, wasn't there? So, um, I know we said we'd talk about deconvolution. We'll go yeah. through that. And and um, star net, star removal. Um, but, Graham, let's cover your bit first, because we did talk about masking um, a couple of meetings ago. Right. Um, but happy to go over that again. It's not, not a bother. Yeah. So, um, so you, specifically, you were talking about backgrounds? So Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I create the masks. It's not a problem. But when I invert them, they disappear. <laughs> and I lose them for some reason. I don't know what the hell I'm doing wrong. Right, OK. Um, I'm guessing they're still there, but not visible. No, I can I can turn them on. Not I mean when I create them, that like the majority of the screen's red, and then yeah. you invert invert them to protect the galaxies, and they just disappear. They're gone. Even even the tab on the side, it's normally brown, will actually change colour back out again. Oh wow! Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, okay. <laughs> I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> Right, okay. Have you got Pixel Insight open on the computer that you're using at the moment? No, no, no it's upstairs. Okay. Um, okay, so just talk us through what you do to invert it. What what keystrokes are you using? Um, I'll invert it in the menu on the drop down menu for uh, masks. Yeah. You've got the invert button, yeah. and I'll just use that to invert it. But once I invert it, whatever I do on the background, it affects the whole screen. If, if I start running um, curves, mm. the mask isn't doing anything at all. Well, if, it's, um, if you're removing the mask completely, then it will affect. You've lost you've lost the, the effects of the mask entirely, haven't you? Yeah, but I'm not removing it. I'm inverting it. <laughs> or trying to. Mm. <laughs> Strange, right? When you invert it, it doesn't show up as much as it does when, when you've got the red background. Yeah, but the yeah. brown tab, the brown tab should still say brown, shouldn't it? Yeah, it should. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> okay. I did have some funny issues with my version of PixInsight when I first installed it. Um, because I was trying to be clever and installed it on E rather than C mm. drive, which C the root drive, uh, was main drive. And in the end, I got fed up with it, uninstalled it, and reinstalled it back on C, the main drive, and it's been working fine since. I don't know if that might be something, just things did, certain things didn't work, others did. I don't know why. Uh, it's not something I've ever come across, to be honest. I don't know whether <laughs> you, have, you have, Graham. Yeah. But hmm. the only reality I've had recently is you know this this weighted batch processing. Yeah. Yeah. First time I open it up, it doesn't fit on the screen. No. <laughs> the bottom disappear. <laughs> but if I close it and open it up again, then it's okay. And I don't know what's going on. <laughs> yeah. Have you just updated the latest version? Yeah, I keep it up to date, yeah. yeah. So before I updated the latest version, because you actually had to get rid of it, didn't you, and reload it? Yes. Before, everything was fine. But it just seems to be this latest version. Hmm. So what happens with... Is it the, the dialogue box that expands too far then, Graham? No one yes. Right. Yeah, it disappears off the bottom of the screen. <laughs> and, and I can't drag it back because it's it seems to have enlarged the uh, the window. Bizarre. Yeah. 
I've just, I've just opened mine and uh, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Weird. Weird. I wonder if it's to do with the screen resolution I've set it to. Hmm. Might be. Mm. That's the only thing I could think, think of, you know, hazard a guess at. Yeah. What size monitor are you using? Is, um, is it a laptop size or bigger? Yeah, it's a, it's a laptop, just the standard 15 inch laptop. Yeah. It's probably a resolution issue. Mm. It okay. could be that nice, Mr. Uh, Gates. Just, be it. Uh, yeah. Uh, one of his updates, I love. Sorted out a problem that didn't exist. Yeah. Uh, he keeps updating my uh, EQ mod driver, oh. which is a real nuisance. Every time we have an update of Windows, Helen's laptop loses, well, loses the uh, network printer. It mm. reassigns the uh, network address. <laughs> and it doesn't matter how many times I've nailed it down and I mean you will yeah. use this for the printer it changes the bugger crazy <laughs> yeah. yeah I'm of the same um, isn't it anyway it doesn't solve Graham's problem no it doesn't it's, it's just a shame we can't um, help you out with that one Graham see, you know, see what keystrokes you're using I mean it, in the main um you're right, Graham. If you invert a mask, it makes it a bit more transparent in some areas, doesn't it? And, that, and that's what you really should. I guess that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to just um, isolate the, the stars and the galaxies away from the background, so you can then do your, do your curves adjustments on the background. That's the right process. Um, so in that regard, you, you know, you're trying to do the right thing. It's just um, you know, the fact that the mask isn't activating. Mm, bizarre. I've, I've not come across that. If, um, if, I don't, if I don't invert it, then it works. It works fine. I can I can adjust the galaxy. But I don't want to adjust the galaxy. I want, I want to revert it to adjust the background. How are you making your mask? Are you using a, a luminance layer to make the mask? Yeah, well, I've tried all. I've tried all three methods that they suggest to make the mask. I mean, um, you can do it on the um, is it the star method? Way of doing it, you can make a mask off of that. Yeah. But it's the same effect. Whichever, whichever way I make the mask, as soon as I invert it, just just doesn't work. <laughs> Graham, you, you know when you first apply the mask, yeah. um, and and you select select the mask from the drop down. There's, there's a little little tick box, box yeah. just underneath there. There's certain at that point, before you actually open the mask up. I lost half of that. Can you say that again? <clears throat> yeah, when you when you first select your mask, you get a little drop down, don't you? So you can select the image you're using for your mask. Yeah. 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 Well, on, on that little window where you make the selection, there's a tick box that says invert mask. Ah. So have you tried doing it at that point instead of doing it from the drop-down menu on the main window? That's an option, isn't it? Yeah, I've never noticed that. Yeah. If you're still having the same problem if you've done that and the mask is applied but you're still having um, issues with what um, the process that you're then using is still doing, so if you're using curves and it's taking it too far, um, chances are your mask isn't strong enough. Yeah. You, can, you can actually take a mask image and run curves on that itself to make it brighter and darker. And yeah. just put the mask up in the areas that you want it. So you can tweak a mask. Um, I do that uh, quite a bit because, well, certainly, I, and certainly in my daytime photography as well, when I've been doing multiple exposures and I've been looking for uh, high dynamic range, the, you know, the ability to um, get the right... A set of tones in in the grayscale really does affect how how the mask works when you apply it. Yeah. Um, so you know, have a, have a tweak around with that. Yeah. 
All right, cheers. <laughs> just, just as an aside, just before we go on to more picks insights of the one thing I've changed in the shed just recently, I've um, started using the multi-star uh, guiding on PhD. Are you guys using that at all? Yeah. No. Yeah, so I've, I've, I've tried it recently. Has it improved it at all? I don't know whether it's incre uh, improved the guiding or because you're an averaging more points, the numbers look better. I was going to say, <laughs> the numbers look really good. I'm not entirely sure that I've got a different result. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, when I first did it, I noticed quite an improvement. But recently, I seem to be getting a very noisy background in my um, guide camera. Now, whether that's because of the moon's around or not focused. Possibly but... lighter sky, Graham, yeah. 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 yeah definitely. So when it's like that, no, it doesn't make a lot of difference. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I... mine is just not making a great deal of difference with mine at the moment uh, because there's all these very limited guide stars. Yeah. Working at F stupid. Oh, because are you using an off, off axis guider? Yeah, I'm working at F10. So it's sometimes a bit of a task finding one. Mm. Dave, do you find working at F10? I'm using this the RC, and the guide stars are that faint, it's hard to see them. It is difficult, yeah, and it's difficult to find one. Yeah. If you want to use a tiny bit of uh, real estate you're looking at, I did wonder about sticking the guide uh, scope on it and seeing how I got on with that. But yeah. so far, touch wood, um, I've managed to find one. But I am using guide exposures of four and five seconds. Oh, yeah. All yeah. right. Hmm. Wow. I've, I've never bothered with a, an, an off axis guide. What, what's the benefit of one of those? I've always used a guide scope. I know it probably makes your image train a bit. Oh, not so much cleaner. I, I guess in terms of balancing the scope, you haven't got a guide scope swinging off that as well. Um, you know, to screw that up. You haven't got yeah, problems with your flexure. Yeah, the, I think the big advantage is you're getting at the same photo length as your, your imaging right. scope. Right. And no differential. So your, your graph doesn't need to look very good <laughs> for it to, to guide well enough. Yeah. yeah. I've seen people fantastic flat guiding graphs but they're using a short focal length scope so it's not quite as good as it looks <laughs> yeah also on the SCTs you sometimes get mirror flop as well yeah so as the mirror is moving if you're you're using a separate guide scope it doesn't follow that motion oh yeah yeah which is why they always recommend that you, if you're using the focuser, you always do the last bit anti anti-clockwise to take up the backlash in the focusing train. Well, that was what I was told many, many moons ago. Um, the other option is to drill log trails in the back of your room. Um, <laughs> SCT and put some locking bolts in if you're feeling brave yeah I was going to say that's I can <laughs> see that going wrong <laughs> <laughs> right okay right. interesting stuff right okay tell you what let's do um, so is it have, have you guys used uh, Starnet in Pix Insight yet tried it I've used it, but, but I haven't got it installed in Pix Insight. It's just a, as a standalone. Do you know how to install it? No. Do you want to go through that? Yeah, yeah go on, see if I've got it installed correctly. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's pretty straightforward. I think it's pretty straightforward. So if you call up the Starnet um, uh, process, it gives you a little... Um, Drop down box. Um, and the process itself requires two files, two .pb files that sit in 
Um, start on that. Well, uh, I'm on a Mac, so this might be different. It's actually in the Pix, in my applications, uh, Pix Insight library folder. It uh, is on Windows. Yeah. So you've yeah. got these these two files. One's called RGB Starnet Weights .pb, and the other one's a grayscale weights file called Mono Starnet uh, Weights .pb. And once you've mapped those over to the two um, uh, uh, paths that you're given in in the in the dialog box, that's it. You literally just drop the triangle onto the image that you want to take the stars out of and let it run. And it's, it's as simple as that. Very easy to do. So uh, how are you set up then, Steve? Same for yourself? Yeah, I think so. So I've opened Star on it. Yep. And you just click apply. Don't see what happens. So are you actually in Pix Insight, Steve? Yes. Yeah. I've got Starnet plus plus beta open. This is a more recent one. Right, let's just check how you've got to that. So if you if you go Process, process, yeah. yeah. Um, and then it's uh, mask generation. Just a minute. We've got, it's not responded. <laughs> Great. Uh, task manager. This picks into that gun. <laughs> there we go. And task done. That's killed you. <laughs> oh, it'll want to do the bloody update now. Let's <laughs> slow <clears throat> down. See what you're doing. No, it hasn't. Oh. No, it hasn't. That's it. Open an image. Go on. You'll do. Right. What was all that? <laughs> all right, you laughing away. <laughs> you try doing this in front of some in people. Right, Starnet. <laughs> oh, shit, he's just open Starnet. He doesn't say anything about creating it. Oh, create Starmask. Right then. Right, so you should have just a very small... Dialog box in the middle of the screen. Yeah. Uh, can you see that this this two? Uh, well, it, let me describe it. It says something like stride. Just leave yeah. that one to eight. Yeah. Great star mass. Uh, just leave that unchecked. Unchecked. Right. Unchecked. Yeah. Um, and then uh, RGB weights file. You'll need uh, to, to locate that file um, on your hard drive. It should be installed. Right, I've got a mono image open. Does that matter? No, that's fine. RGB weights, no, I haven't got that. Right. So on a Windows, Windows then, um, uh, Graham, uh, yeah. what, what's the path to get that? Um... That's exactly the same, exactly the same. It's in Pix Insight Library. Yeah. On your hard drive. Open up, your, open up your programs. Um, mm. yeah, just, let's see. Program files. That's down here somewhere. Fix insight. Then library. Library, yeah. It should be in there. Called oh, RGB Starnet Wait. Yeah, BB. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. That's the first one. Yeah, what do I need to do with that then? Uh, Right, so th going through the um, the Starnet dialog box, you need to put that path back to that file in the in there. Right. Go on then. Give me a clue. How do I do that? 
That's a good question because it's ages since I've had to do it. Um, if you open that dialogue box, you start at dialogue box. Yeah. <laughs> on the uh, white bar, there's your little file thing. Click that to yes. set the image bar or set the path. No, I'm not struggling here. Don't click that, you idiot. No. Oh. It's one of the four, four small icons down the bottom. Is it the spanner? I think it's the spanner, isn't it? On the dialog box itself, in the bottom right-hand corner, Steve. Yeah. It's four little icons. If you hit the spanner... I, I've only got three. All right. I've got reset. How I got it up on that box, Steve. Yeah. It's a uh, path to weighted files or something similar to that. Or there'll be no file selected. It's uh, the icon you need is the spanner one. It's called preferences. There's no spanner, <laughs> except this one sat here. <laughs> Can you put a screenshot up, Steve? Yeah, share your screen with us. Uh, just a moment. Uh, you're, you're the host, Chris, so you might have to... Uh, yeah, I'll make sure everybody can share. share. Yeah. OK, Steve, that's set. You can share your screen now. All right, OK, just a moment. It's possible. Best open an image. Uh, yes, screen. Not that one. Yeah, there you go. We got it. Yep. Right. Oh, you should have a, a bigger dialogue box up there for Starnet. Ah. Yeah, I was going to say. I, I think you might be a version behind. Right. So well, that's yeah. why. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's a slightly bigger dialog box, as Graham says. Hmm. And there is there is a spanner icon on there that allows you to... Um, Point to the RGB star net. Yeah, oh. there, there, there's two paths that you can... Um, yeah, make. there's the mono, yeah. mon, mono and RGB one, yes. Yeah. Leave those in the thing. So I, I'm, I'm, right, I need to download that. Right. Hello. Do you know? No, I don't. So, I'm going to have to reinstall that, probably for when we are not doing this then. No, because that, that will, yeah, I'll yeah. <laughs> kill it. I'll kill it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's bound to, isn't it? Yeah. See, I haven't got many uh, RGBs on it at the minute. Just my... Really? Uh, when I loaded this up at the weekend, I actually put, but I, I actually was allowed to put both the grayscale and the RGB files in in two yeah. separate boxes. Yeah, right, right. I so need it works for both, then, doesn't it, Graham? Yeah, so, yeah. Right, I need to do that. Then I'll shut that down. Yeah, right. But trust me, once you've got that set up, it's literally drop the triangle onto the picture. Yeah, let it run. Right. Away it goes. Okay. Yeah. Very easy to do, right. and actually the results are pretty good. It's not much. The ones I've done it on, there's not much cleaning up re required, because mm. uh, you, you tend to be left with a few artifacts. I usually take that file into Photoshop and just do a, a spot removal, um, just to get the the background even again. Yeah. Uh, but it's um, it, it's been really well. It's really useful. Um, obviously, all the galaxy pictures have been taken of, of late. There's not many stars in the background anyway. It's when you get to, you know, more of the Milky Way stuff where, you know, you can, you can do that. Certainly mm. with the big nebulas. Okay. Um, so that's that's that. Uh, by all means, Steve, yeah, give us a shout if you... That will do. Yeah, stop doing I'll, that. I'll, I'll, go and, I'll go and do that sometime later this week. I have got one question for you, Chris. <laughs> yeah, sure. 
once you take all the stars out and adjust everything, how do you put them back? How do I put them back? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't use Pix Insight. <laughs> I don't use Pix Insight. Yeah, oh, fair enough. <laughs> um, because, uh, well, because Photoshop's got, um, it's, it's so powerful in terms of its blending modes. Right. Um, you know, it knocks Pix Insight into a cocked hat. So I'd, I'd lob the two files into Photoshop and um, either use a blending mode or a uh, or another mask just to, oh. just to burn them back in. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, if you really want to do it, it's pixel math. Uh, yes, <laughs> it's pixel math. Yeah. Run for the hill. Yeah, if, if you know <laughs> Photoshop, it's much oh, easier. Dave said he was going to give us a tutorial on how to program pixel math. He did. Yeah. That'll he be has done his run for the hills. Yeah. <laughs> well, I am recording this for him. So, Dave, when you get to this bit, <laughs> we are taking the Mickey out of you. Uh, yes, um, you're quite right, Graham. If you wanted to do it that way, um, I think by that point, I'm because I, I think to myself, uh, phew, how do you guys go about getting your stars right? So once you've, it's all right taking all the stars away so you can get at the object that you're after. But really, um, I, I suppose like what I end up with is a really blown out sort of object because I'm trying to trying to deal with the stars. In like, I've almost got like three images to background the stars and the thing I'm I'm shooting in the first place, and I'm sort of trying to bring them bring them all together. Um, but that's you know that's. That's the real, real test in it because if you've spent a lot of time doing the object, chances by then your stars are absolutely all over the place. Um, and what I keep forgetting to do is making myself a copy of the individual images before I started to process them all. Because if you you go so far down the route with one, you know you really are you really are stuck. Um, okay. I've used Pix um, Starnet. Standalone. Yeah, I, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Take them out, save both, process the image, if you want to call it image. Yep. And then I've gone back into the star one and generally used uh, Neil Carboni's Select Brighter Stars. Yeah. Reduce them down a bit. And then just boosted the select them again. And then boost the saturation of the stars and it leaves the background okay. So yeah. you get some star colour in there. Yeah. And then chuck the two together in Photoshop. So yeah. nothing to do with Pix Insight at all, I'm afraid. No. No, it's, it's something I've not, I've, I've not done with Pix Insight. I've had a go using uh, Starnet um, to get stars away from uh, a dark nebula and then used Pixel Math. Mm. actually to boost uh, the dark nebula so you know if you're doing something like like the iris uh, nebula it's a that's a bugger to process because you've got such a bright core and then everything else is just dark dust all the way around you almost need like a fourth layer of the stuff that isn't the stars or the background but it is actually just dark stuff and you just need to lift it away from the background to make sure that it's it, it's kind of visible that and m78 drive me nuts <laughs> Yeah, re reflection nebulas are, are, are a bugger to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm st still practicing with that sort of stuff. Okay. Um, let's, let's move on to... Uh, right. Has anybody used uh, deconvolution? Planetary I've tried. and solar only. <laughs> right. You want to know how to use it? Yeah, yeah, go on. Yeah. Let's have a wonder. The better. the better. Right. So the last time I did actually use it was on that picture of M57 because I shot that hydrogen alpha data, um, and I wanted to make sure that I was going to get some detail in in the in the faint ring. I could see it, but I just wanted to see if I could make it better. Um, so. 
you spend a lot of time getting ready to use deconvolution. Um, so I'll walk you through the steps. This is the way I've been shown how to use it. First things first, um, you start off making um, a, a dynamic uh, point spread function. So basically, it's like a measurement of your stars. Uh, so if you go into your process and find dynamic PSF, um, basically, um, it allows you to select stars in the image that you're going to apply the process to. And um, it allows you to pick well, as many stars as you want, because what you're trying to do is make an image of an average star. And that's one of the components that you need for deconvolution. Now, one thing I didn't realize when I first started to use this, and I just couldn't get it to work, is deconvolution is, is de-blurring. It's not sharpening. And, and there are different types of blurs in, in, in photography. Um, so there's Gaussian blur, uh, Moffat blur, I think there's Lorenzo blur, some, something like that. Um, so the 20 or so stars that you pick have to be the same type of blur. They've all got to be Gaussian or they've all got to be Moffat. And if you have a mix, it doesn't work properly. So um, if you pick 20 stars and, the, and it'll tell you whether it's a Gaussian blur or whatever, and it, they've got to be of a decent size. They can't be too big or too small. So you really have to like, you know, 20 average stars. And when you've got that, you just select all the stars that you've, you've got in the dialog box and you, there's a camera button. You just click that camera button and it gives you um, a picture of your star, your average star. And what it's trying to do is show the roundness of the star, but also if you can think of a um, the way that a, um, a star presents itself to a um, to a camera chip, it's got a really really bright point that dissipates like a cone, and you're after as, as smooth a cone as possible, because um, what deconvolution is going to do is it's going to unblur stuff, but it wants to leave your um, stars natural. If anything goes wrong, it's going to go wrong with these stars in this process. So that's the first step you, you, uh, to create a, a dynamic uh, PSF. The second step is actually to make the strongest mask that you can make by literally uh, taking a... Um, uh, and I do this on a, on, on a luminance layer because it's the luminance layer that I'm trying to, trying to get the most detail in. Um, is to take a, a, a mask and, and push the histogram as far as you can over to the left. And what you end up with is a very red mask. You know, so it's protecting quite a bit of the image. Um, and that is your deconvolution mask, and that gets actually applied to the image. And then the third thing you need is um, star mask. And that star mask uh, needs to be taken from, I mean, this is all working with the image unstretched, by the way. Okay, so if you if you try to make a star mask of a unstretched image, all you tend to get are the very bright stars showing up. So once you've got that, those three things, you can um, go into deconvolution and apply them in, in the process. Um, so your point spread function image, you can nominate it and say, I want to use that one. Uh, in, in the dialog box. The um, background mask you apply actually to the image and the star mask goes into a, a local support um, box. So basically you're applying two masks to the same image. Um, once you've got all those things in place, the recommendation is that you take a test sample of an area that you want to want to test it on because the process of um, the convolution takes a lot of uh, computer power um, and it does many iterations. I think it's 70 or 80 iterations. It takes quite a while to do. And if you've got a slow computer, it will just churn and churn and churn. So the best thing to do is, um, is to um, just take a, a swatch of the image and just apply it to that, that preview because it will run through the cycles quicker. Um, then in terms of the settings for uh, for deconvolution, I'm just going to call it up on my screen so I can describe it to you. Uh, this is 
is on my other PC. I'm not, I'm not going to share my screen because my internet won't go. Um, so basically, you, um, there's three tabs in deconvolution. The one that you're after is called external PSF. Um, so um, the first box allows you to pick, pick the PSF that you've um, selected. And then as you work down the that dialog box, there's uh, a, a choice of algorithms. Um, you leave one on uh, the first one on uh, regularized Richard, Richardson Lucy uh, and leave it at 10 iterations and, and set the target for whatever image you're doing. And main, mainly for me, it's, it's a luminous image rather than a, an RGB. And then there's a drop, there's a collapsible uh, um, section called D ringing. Basically, you tick that box, and then you go in there and apply a local D-ringing, which is your star mask. Drop that into that box, and then you've got two sliders. Well, this is a this is classic fix insight. They give you a slider that can go right to this end of the uh, end of the scale, but the effective use of that is within everything on the left. It's ridiculous, uh, and they're called global dark and global bright. And basically, what what you do is you, you balance the dark and the bright depending on what sort of artifacts the process gives your um, gives your image. Um, so when you test, uh, do, do your first test, um, and I think you found this um, uh, found this Graham when we talked about it previously. If your masks are wrong, it will just rubbish your image. It just it just absolutely destroys it. So the, the masks have really got to work for you. The, the sort of changes that you make in the really small increments um, and what you're after is a slight sort of brightening of your stars because it's bringing them back into focus but it should reveal if you're doing faint nebula or if you're doing something like the elephant's trunk nebula it should give you what looks like a sharpened image but it's really de-blurring it's, it's a very similar um, sort of process to um, Registacks when you're doing the moon and you're using the wavelets, it's, it's sort of crunching that data back together. They, re um, they reckon that you do that. This is one of the very first processes that you do before you do noise reduction or anything, um, because it's it's physically going to change your data once it's once it's once it's been applied. Once you're happy with the uh, you know with um, the results you're getting in your preview window. Then you set the iterations to 50 or 70, and then just hit the um, apply it to your main main image, and you should see that that slight. Uh, like I say it looks like um, sharpening, but it's not. It's just de blurring the image. It's an absolute faff to do, and honestly, I don't use it all the time. But I'm very selective about where I do use it. So where where was after that faint detail? Thought that you know I'm going to spend some time doing that and, and and also the noise reduction around that because I wanted to bring I was less worried about the center of M57 I was more worried about the outer the outer halo because I wanted to show that um, so yeah I mean it's there's a good uh, video um, from a chap um, in uh, on YouTube uh, by the name of Sean Nielsen it goes under the name of Visible Dark you follow his tutorial on deconvolution um, it will walk you through the right steps it's pretty good the best explanation I've seen of it um, but like I say I, I don't use it all the time because um, you know what you get out of it is is actually um, you know it's not a lot for the effort that you put into it uh, Chris like, when I've tried it I've struggled to find enough uh, of the average stars. And, uh, you know, I'll pick a star which I think looks like an average star. But when, when the readings come up, it's out of the range. Right. You know, when you, th they reckon you should pick about 30 stars. Well, you know, I've, I've got to 15 and I can't find any more. <laughs> Honestly, I, I mean, I've never used more than 20. I know the book, yeah. the book probably says 30, but if I can get a point spread function that's the best I can make, I'm happy to use that. 
Um, and if I'm in any doubt, I'll just make the, the mask even stronger or the star mask even stronger. Because all you're really trying to do is protect the stars from going an odd shape. Because one of the other things that you can do with deconvolution, I've not tried this, but I've seen it done, is if you've got some um, egg-shaped stars, if you've got some natural blur in your image, you can de-blur them. Um, so you can you can set your stars back to a bit more round. Um, and I think that's done in either the parametric or the motion blur um, spread function. But basically, you say, look, my stars look like this. They're this sort of rugby shape rugby ball shape um, and it'll it will try and knock them back into a bit more round that's really you know that's really what it's trying to do I do try to avoid stars like that though. yeah exactly most of the time <laughs> you're getting your imaging trained so you haven't got that that problem to worry about yeah. um, you know we spend most of our time doing doing that but it's um, depends what you know if you've had a bad night with seeing and stuff and you want the data you, the central object's okay but you've just ended up with some some rubbish around the edges. The easiest way is actually just crop the bloody things out and just that's it. I've cropped that. It's done. <laughs> anyway, so that's as much as I know about deconvolution. And All right, thank you. There is a um, the opposite of that is convolution. So there is a, a process in there to to deliberately blur stuff. Mm. Um, and that is useful if you're putting a luminous layer with a colour layer uh, and trying to get rid of the uh, the noise in the background of the colour layer because it's really, a, you know, noise reduction is just selective blurring in certain bits of the image. Um, and if you recover it back to a really sharp luminous layer, you can you can achieve both in the, in, in the same space. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm coming to the conclusion that I'm probably going to be better not using Pix Insights as much as I'm trying to. <laughs> I, I'm not really a Photoshop person. And, and layers is, it sort of baffles me. <laughs> but I think I'm going to have to get into it. And, I mean, people uh, like Nick Kimenek, but he doesn't use Pix Insights all the time. He, he blends stuff in Photoshop. Yeah, affinity as he started to use now. Because I, I, I mean, I, I subscribe to um, Photoshop and Lightroom CC for my daylight photography, and I get an update a month to Photoshop. Mm. And every time I get that update, nine times out of ten, it's an improvement. I've never seen that with Pix Insight. It's like it's stuck in time. It does some things brilliantly, but other stuff, I'm just thinking, it's being left behind. You know, uh, and mm -hmm. there are there are much easier ways uh, to go and and sort out, um, you know, what this thing's doing uh, with other products. You know, I, I think I've said to you guys before, I use um, uh, Denoise uh, AI Denoise from Topaz Labs because it's easy. And it's really effective. Yeah. Use it on low light, one percent, and on an astro image, and it works wonders. Yeah. And again, uh, yeah, I think I've got I've had about three updates since I bought that thing, and it's just improved time over time over time. Yeah. But there, there are some things in uh, that I like in Pix Insight. Um, you know, the ability to get your your image from stacked through to. Um, <coughs> You know, through to a to something that you can say, right, okay, now I'm going to solve certain issues with that image. I might not use all of the Pix Insight functions because, frankly, some of them have been left behind. Um, but you know, you can't go out and you know, because I've used Pixel Map before, and I don't mind using Pixel Map because I think it's a really powerful tool. You can't find that in Photoshop. Yeah. You know, so. Um, I guess this forum has become more about how do you process photos than it's um, how do you use Pix Insight because <laughs> we've all arrived at the same point. There are some things you just go, look, I, I forced myself to learn Photoshop and learn to live with layers and understand what layers do because actually um, it's 10 times harder to do it in Pix Insight. Well, that's just how it feels. I think yeah. um, Pix Insight 
now I've got used to it a little bit better, especially with the Starlight Express camera I'm using at the moment. Yeah. Um, and got the cosmetic correction working right, is making a better job of the stack yeah. than I was getting in APP yeah. with their bit bad pixel map. Uh, don't get me wrong, APP was was good, but Pixel Insight seems to be a little bit better with it. And then I got started in Pixel Insight and I think why am I bothering? Because I know how to do this in Photoshop. <laughs> so it just gets thrown over to Photoshop uh, mm. very quickly at the moment, I'm afraid. Uh, and, and I'm sure there are there, there are techniques within Pix Insight that. Uh, yeah, I mean, work very well. Yeah, I've got some some of the Photoshop tools that you've already talked about, but I like I like um, now they've put um, Starnet in there. I think that's great. I think the star reduction process that they've got in there is good. Um, I think some of the masking um, tools are a bit basic, but they do work really, really well. Um, but to be honest with you, I've got used, I'm a daylight photography, I've got uh, really used to using luminance layers um, and, and the blending modes. It's, it's just far easier, far easier to do. And I find myself, even on some of the images that I'm, well, I did that um, M82, um, uh, Hubble image. I was doing, you know, basic corrections, dodging and burning like a daylight photo, because that was the that was a, a much easier way to solve some of the fact that you know the, the NASA images were so poorly overlapped. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I just I've, I've never never done it. I've never done a mosaic in um, in, in Pixinsight either. I know it can do them. But, um, I did have a go with some DSLR wide field. Yeah, it does it does work? Yeah. But it's fiddly. It's and fiddly. that's the reason I got APP for mosaics, for one in yeah. particular. Um, and probably Registar. Now they've updated it. I know it's ancient. Well, it's not ancient. But they've updated it now. They updated it a couple of months ago. Uh, and it'll probably do the mosaic that I wanted it to do four years ago or whenever I bought APP. Um, yeah, I, I'll be honest with you. I tend to um, I tend to use Microsoft Ice, um, the, the image uh, combination tool that they they released ages ago. Um, I don't know whether it's still available in their store, but it's really powerful. It, it's available somewhere. I, reinstalled it not long ago um, it did go missing and it's not updated anymore but ah. it is available uh, and I use that for the I use it for solar when I was right. doing the uh, and the moon it's great yeah. the moon yes yeah mm -hmm. um, yeah the solar one where I've got when I use the the calcium um and it works fine yeah. most of the time. Yeah. Uh, I've used the, the one that Canon provide on their website uh, for doing things like noctilucent clouds. Mm. All right. It stacks those pretty well, matches them up. That's all you need, one? isn't it? Yeah. What's the other one? Is it Sequencer or something does one as well? Oh, is that, that, some, is that yeah. some, something else? It does something else. Right. It's the sequ sequator. That's it's, the one. Yeah. So is hmm. Oh, that puts a foreground on a. Yeah, it's yes. it splits the foreground and the background. So it's that's a, the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So if There's you're doing another the Milky, one, so I can't remember. Yeah, if you're doing a Milky Way shot, you can um, yeah. use a static tripod and just take image, image, image. I think when I went to Tenerife, I did that. I just took a load of images. Uh, I use a Mac, so the, the equivalent on a Mac is called Story Landscape Stacker. Mm. And basically, it just says, you know, what's the foreground, what's the, what's the sky? And it will stack the sky and then give you a choice of foregrounds to yeah. but then map it to. Yeah. Um, so you, you get a longer exposure. It does mm. some other stuff as well. I mean, it allows you to use darks and whatever to 
uh, to get rid of noise and, and whatnot. Um, but I think Sequator does pretty much the same thing. Of course, Sequator is free, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and Microsoft. Um, yeah, useful tools. There are lots of tools out there. It's picking the ones for the job and picks mm. inside, does a job in certain places. That's yeah. 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 And I think, I, I, yeah, you can't, I don't think you can be a slave to one. I think it's, I think you're missing out. You know, you've got to try all the stuff because uh, people have solved various things in, in different ways, in different packages. Uh, if you can navigate your way around them, you can get the best of best of all worlds, really. But like I say, at the moment, for me, I'm, if I get to the point where I've done a little bit of noise reduction in, in PixInsight, I've got the colour more or less where I want it, um, and I've got the stars reduced, um, then I'm probably, um, you know, doing all my blending um, in, in Photoshop and then, uh, you know, applying saturation and a few other things because, you know, um, the, the tools in Photoshop are, are, are just, um, well, they're, they're more subtle. You know, they, sometimes you feel like with um, Fixed Insight, you've got an on-off switch. You put a slider like that, tong, you know, it's it's too far that way and, you know, there's no middle, middle ground to be had. Yeah. So yeah, there you go. That, that, that's what we said we'd cover this uh, this time around. Hope you found that um, you know found it useful. I mean, in terms of, I can't remember who said it. I think it was on the forum. Somebody commented that they, they thought the images were getting better. Yeah. You know, the monthly images were getting better, and I agree. I think um, lots of people have. Um, well, they're posting more for a start, and um, the quality of the image is really, really improved. Um, and I think, you know, it's the, these advances in software that are helping people get along. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So what what are you working on at the moment, then? What's uh, what's what's in the can? What's, what's ready to be shot? Go on, Steve. NGC 2403. I've got lots of data on that. I've got to sort out because um, I've got some crap in there that I need to uh, call. Um, I've also got uh, NGC 3718, which is the Welk, and it's Mate, whatever that one's called. That's another galaxy. Um, I've got loads of stuff on M3. Mm. Uh, waiting to be done. Um, hang on, M95, I think it is. Uh, and I don't think I ever did anything with M96 data collected. And then a bit further around, it's, um, oh, NGC4567, and it's made the twins or the eyes, or whichever one it is. Yeah, it, what yeah. in the chain? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I was doing that a few nights ago as well. Mm. Yeah. So they're all sat there on the hard drive. <laughs> <laughs> no shortage of data then. Fair yeah. enough. It's taken me three days to post up the solar that I did last time now. <laughs> it's taking longer and longer. Oh, and other news, my QSI on its way to on its whole way to its holes in Portugal to be hopefully repaired. I've had a go at a couple of quasars oh, nice. recently. Uh, well, there's the first one that was discovered, 3C273. It was quite, quite easy. Mm. What, about 16th magnitude? So modern cameras, it's not a problem, is it? Mm. Uh, and then I don't know if you spotted in the, um, the sky notes in the BAA journal, the, the latest one. Uh, it mentions in there um, a gravitationally lensed quasar, which appears double. So I was doing that the other night. Cool. So, yeah, very tiny objects, but <laughs> interesting to think that you're doing something that's Eight billion light years away. Yeah. 
Yes, well, it's, it's got a reasonable size galaxy in the same field as well. Can't remember the number of it. Right. What about yourself, to the Graham? Um, got nothing in the can waiting until we I'm still waiting for the galaxies to move around a bit so I can just leave the uh, scope running all night without having to sort of get up in the morning and find it upside down. <laughs> <laughs> It worked fine upside down. Yeah, yeah, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Another month we can start sort of imaging in sort of serious sort of fashion. Once they get round a bit more. Break out the narrow band stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go back go back to the GT eighty one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I agree with you. I what you've got on on the go, Graham? Uh, Chris, sorry. Um, what have I done? I've lost count. <laughs> <laughs> it's nothing exciting. It's probably something what was straight up in the air. Um, you know, less atmosphere to go through. I don't know. I mean, I did M eighty two the other the other month, so I thought I'd do M eighty one as a uh, you know, with a bit more magnification than I'd normally have, um, to see what that turns out like. The subs look like right on that look good, uh, but I've got nowhere near. I did did something strange. I asked it to uh, um, sequence generator pro. It was going to finish that run about two in the morning, by which time um, uh, the Crescent Nebula was just about clearing next door's roof. So. I decided I was going to send it over there, but when I looked at the subs the following morning, it just carried on and shot a, um, two hours of HA on what looks like M81. Right. <laughs> Which I never asked it to do. <laughs> I'm like, oh, great, okay. So I've now got a run of um, HA um, images called NGC 6888 that are really M81. <laughs> <laughs> I've never done that before. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so I've, once I've untangled that, I mean, there might be some useful stuff in that. In that, I mean, I I did shoot a fair bit of HA on um, NGC on the Whale Galaxy, mm. and the subs look really good. But will it bloody stack? Because there's so few stars around there um, that you know show up. Mind you, I'm using a the narrowband filters three three point five nanometers, so it's it's tight, but um, I'll see if I can crowbar it into some sort of fashion and add that data to that. That, that should improve it because the, the actual galaxy itself, um, there's quite a few emission nebulae in there, um, like a chain of them yeah. um, right, right through the centre that I'd like to add. Um, what else did I point it at? Oh, I can't remember. I'd have to go yeah. out. Yeah, I've got enough to shuffle around. <laughs> Yeah. Let me untangle M81 first and see what that looks like. Yeah. Uh, I think I've got to, not myself, um, really trying to sort this solar out. Um, basically to get an e more even disc again on with the lump uh, and to battle the, uh, the quark. I can't make my mind up whether it's going to go back or not because um, I've only got it on loan. Um, it's 50 at the minute whether it goes back. Which one have you had most success with? The loan because I've had it longer. <laughs> And it seemed like a good idea to get the uh, the beast, the the one two seven presser, yeah. Nine is it, whatever it is, twelve hundred. Um, that the idea for that was the original initial idea was to use it for white light solar right. with the Herschel wedge, yeah, uh, to get into the sunspot, but it. It's a bit bouncy on the EQ6. 
um, especially when you're trying to focus into it. I need to sort of focus rail, um, but I need to get to the back of the garage to get access to the lathe. But I can't do that at money because it's all a bloody box of the lathe. Fair yeah, I'll get to it one of these days. I'll get to it, honestly. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You're amongst friends. We're feeling your pain. We're not telling you to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, of course, it'll not be long before the, the gas giants put an appearance in, which means I've got, then got to lug the C11 onto the PQ6. Mm. Get the steps out. <laughs> Yeah. Hello, come and all these steps while I put this bugger up for you. <laughs> I should have checked, you know, when I went up to um, I was up top of Mantor on Monday, <laughs> uh, just before the uh, sun came up. So to the south, what was what was visible then? Because it was, either, well, I'm, I'm assuming it was either Venus or Jupiter. The Jupiter. It's Venus is evening now. Right. Ish. I tell you, it looked aside. I mean, because it, it almost looked orange. No, yeah. with the sun coming up. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Still down in the dirt, they are. Boy. Gas And no doubt I'll be out there flogging a dead horse again <laughs> into the early hours of the night, trying to get a decent start on our duty. It's been a while, hasn't it? Mars was relatively easy last year. Relatively. Yeah, no, it was. I enjoyed it. Was it was nice and high up. Yeah. Makes a hell of a difference. It does. No, I enjoyed doing that one. Yeah. All right. Anyway. Okay. So, um, anything that you want to cover off next time? Do you want to... Hey, shall we have a, a session on Photoshop? Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, okay. Yeah, why not? <laughs> I've only uh, got on, on, the, on the old version, please. All right, what, what, what version have people got? Well, oh, CS6, I think you do. You're on CS6. Yeah, I'm on CS2. <laughs> <laughs> right, the older <laughs> version, please. I, I've got it for Affinity as well. I don't know if you've used that one, have you? I've tried. Mm. So the yeah. name, what you, what, Why call it something different when the names in Photoshop work brilliantly? <laughs> they have <laughs> not got a bloody copyright on the names. Just <laughs> use proper names instead of calling it something bloody stupid. Like <laughs> bloody big slings. I'm sorry. I'll get, on with <laughs> so get back in your yeah. dental. <laughs> Well, big things like names, it is something that nobody can understand, doesn't it? Yeah. Unless you're a mathematician. Let's see. Let's call it all letters of the alphabet in various orders. Confuse the L out of everybody and instead of calling it curves, <laughs> for instance. Yeah, Chris, there, there is one thing in big insight we haven't mentioned yet. Go on. That I use, and that's HDR multi scale transform. Right. Have you tried that? No. <laughs> well, I did um, some two minute exposures on the Orion Nebula, and I've got the core coming out nice. You can see the trapezium. Yep. And that was done using this HDR multi-scale transform. Whereas, you know, the, the, the traditional one is you take a range of exposures and then yeah. stack the different layers. All oh, right, okay. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that is quite powerful. It doesn't always work, but it's, I found it pretty good. Well, I mean, if, it's, if you're getting the trapezium on too many exposures on, on that, that's normally it's, mine's blown out at. Just over a minute. Yeah. 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 Well, well, you you'll see, be able to show us how to do that next time. Yeah. It's on my BAA members page if you want to have a look. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, Graham, you can cover that next time and we'll get Dave to talk to us <laughs> about pixel math. <laughs> <laughs> if, he's, if he's watched this video right to the end, 
Yeah. <laughs> Fix all that. <laughs> right. Right, so I'm going to get the shed open and see what I can see. Yeah, I'm, so, uh, my shed's open. I'll, I'll just turn on the camera. Okay. Okay. Great to see you. Thanks, Chris. Catch you next yeah, time. Thanks, Chris. We'll see yeah. you next time. Bye, bye. Cheers. Yeah, bye. 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 Bye.